Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Andrea Piero, Director of the Visiting Artist Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture by Amanda Williams, who is SAC's Bill and Stephanie Sick Distinguished Visiting Professor. <clears throat> Each academic year, SAC's Visiting Artists Program hosts a variety of presentations by internationally recognized artists, designers, and scholars with the mission to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of contemporary art and culture. Throughout its history, the program has served as a critical resource and inspiration for our community. Tonight, we are honored to have Amanda Williams become a part of our rich history of distinguished guests who have spoken at the school. At the end of the presentation, we'll have about 10 minutes to take four or five questions from the audience before the program concludes at 7.30. Please raise your hand if you have a question and our staff will circulate uh, microphones for your use. We ask that if you're posing a question to please stand and say your name and to keep your question concise. Also to note, if you are in the professional architecture community and are in need of AIA learning unit credits, please see the table in the lobby. There's a sign up sheet out there. So thank you again for joining us this evening, and it is my pleasure to now welcome to the podium SAC President Alyssa Tenney. Thank you, Andrea, and welcome, everyone. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Bill and Stephanie Sick, who in 2006 established the Distinguished Visiting Professorship that bears their name. Bill and Stephanie's generous gift enabled us to bring to campus internationally renowned artists and designers, many of whom don't teach very often or they teach far away, and they partner with SASC's faculty and they teach our students. This extraordinary program has brought such luminaries as Andrea Zettel, Jaime Plenza, Chris Ware, and Anne Hamilton, among many others. Please help me thank Bill and Stephanie with a round of applause. Bill and Stephanie, would you stand or wave? And today we welcome the phenomenal Amanda Williams as the newest Bill and Stephanie Sick Distinguished Visiting Professor. To introduce Amanda, it is my pleasure to welcome to the podium a distinguished professor whose talents enrich our classrooms every each and every semester. Assistant professor in the Department of Architecture, Interior Architecture and Designed Objects, Anne Louie. Anne is a founding partner of Chicago-based architecture office, Future Firm. She is New City's 2018 Designer of the Moment, and of course, the co-curator of the outstanding U.S. Pavilion at the 2018 Venice Architectural Biennial. Please help me welcome Anne Louie. Hi, thank you so much, Alyssa. I had the pleasure of working with Amanda, as well as Andres Hernandez and Shawnee Crow as curator for this year's U.S. Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale, titled Dimensions of Citizenship. Amanda, Andres, and Shawnee's work, situated outside of the pavilion in the courtyard, was the frontispiece of our exhibition. I joke that their work was the first punch thrown, or to phrase it more precisely, it was the first hard question to be asked about what it means to be a citizen today. Recently, I've been thinking a lot about an interview that Amanda gave about her work titled Uppity Negress at the Arts Club of Chicago, where she said, gray is the best color. In the context of her work at the Arts Club, Amanda used gray to describe the possible interpretations of a text that hung on a banner, which drew from the words of both Sandra Bland and Michelle Obama. This text would be read in one way by those who are familiar with police brutality but by others, Amanda pointed out, the text might appear just as a poem. Grayness here evoked the possibility for a multi-layered reading of the text, flickering between several possible meetings rather than a two-sided interpretation, gray rather than black or white. Grayness also characterizes Amanda's pedagogical generosity. She makes space for the viewer's reading to grow through her work that you might, like me, start by seeing a poem, but eventually learn to read and understand much more. 
In that same interview, Amanda also spoke about how her work is both a cocoon and the ability to confront, a sense of spatial interiority paired with extrovertedness. Even as Amanda's work engages hard questions about the world that we live in, it also always makes a space for us to grow, like a cocoon, and emerge transformed, more prepared to then confront the world in turn. In this way, I wondered if being in or near Amanda's grayness is similar to what author and activist Bell Hooks calls the margin, defined not as a space of being marginalized by others, but as a vital edge from which to look outward towards new horizons. Grayness might be the space that Hooks describes as offering the possibility of radical perspective from which to see and create to imagine alternative new worlds. Amanda trained and practiced as an architect before dedicating herself full time to her work as an artist, though I think gray here too applies to the blurriness of disciplinary boundaries. She challenges all of us not to think about art and architecture as binaries, but instead as practices that are nested, intersecting, sometimes tangled, sometimes irreconcilable, producing new spaces along the way that we can get lost in. The incredible power of this disciplinary grayness affected me profoundly throughout our work for the pavilion at, in Venice. Amanda Andras and Shani's work introduced to the didacticism of an architecture exhibition the imaginary and radical possibilities of artistic abstraction. While the works braiding, steel, or citing might allow an analytical viewer to cite its historical references or catalog its notations, its overall effect was more like a dream. The work evokes things from your subconscious, dark and hopeful, gold and textured, elicited in, the unexpected ways, in unexpected ways as the sculpture stretches beyond the confines of the pavilion's courtyard. Like the work that she creates, Williams' career is multifaceted and constantly involving. She has exhibited widely, including at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Pulitzer Arts Foundation in St. Louis. She is a 2018 US Artists Fellow and a member of the multidisciplinary exhibition team for the Obama Presidential Center. She is a recipient of the 2017 Pulitzer Arts Foundation Design Build Commission in collaboration with SAIC's own Andres Hernandez. She lives and works on Chicago's South Side. We are honored to have her here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Amanda Williams. I paid Anne for that. Now that she'll see it says holding space for. Um, this is beyond unimaginable to be here tonight to speak to all of you. Um, I can say it's a dream come true. So I'm gonna try two things that I am never quite capable of doing. One is actually reading the notes and not just rambling. And two, um, because many of you have probably seen the works that I'm gonna talk about tonight, but there are a number of you who have not, I've tried to sort of change up the way that I'm going to um, work on the presentation. So I'll ask for your indulgence and forgiveness in advance. Um, so I'll begin by a heartfelt thank you to President Tenney and Anne for those warm words, and then also the committee and all of the uh, SAIC staff who's been working so hard to um, not only make this lecture happen, but also the course that's going to be a companion to my visiting professorship. Um, for those of you that don't know, this um, professorship allows for kind of multidisciplinary approach to teaching and experimentation in the way that that works. And so this year I'm honored that I'll be um, sort of overlapping with AIADO, sculpture, and also art history. So I'll be working with Juan Angel Chavez, also Sampada Aranque, and Jonathan Solomon and several of the AIADO faculty. So um, it's good when you can work with your friends and get to take credit for it. Um, I also want to say a, a heartfelt thank you to so many of you who are in the audience. I got to say hi to a few people before, but people from kindergarten to folks I met last week are in the audience. So that's also a rare gift to be able to have um, an audience full of your closest friends. Um, I see my husband sneaking in the back. He's going to be mad I'm embarrassing him. But he plays a key role in the beginning of this. So. Um, 
tonight in honor of and in lieu of Monday night sports, because that was usually what I would be doing about 7 o'clock on Mondays before um, my art life took a life of its own. I wanted to talk about practice or holding space for. So my husband likes to tell athletes that he trains and mentors that it actually takes about 20 years to become an overnight sensation. It's a great opening line, which is why I just stole it, but it also alludes to the invisible and intangible aspects of practice and what it means to need months and years, sometimes decades, for an idea or a creative gesture to gestate, germinate, and evolve and then morph into something else. The evidence of this is obvious in the halls and walls of the historic wings of this great institution we find ourselves in tonight, but it seems less resonant in world cultural spaces reserved for the contemporary. There is both self-imposed and superimposed senses of urgency and desire for the immediate. Never mind your recent accolade. What's the next great thing you're going to do, and when can we expect it? Hey, insert artist name. Many of you are in the room, so you know what I'm talking about. So great to see you. What are you working on? When am I going to be able to see it? This usually ensues panic for me as I feel guilty about not having yet one more thing, even though I've just come back from something. Um, but my new answer is going to be I'm practicing. I'm making space for myself. Um, with that, can we cue the video? But it's, 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 it's easy to, to, to talk about. It's easy to sum it up when you just talk about practice. We sitting here, I supposed to be the franchise player, and we're in here talking about practice. I mean, it, listen, we're talking about practice. Not a game, not a game, not a game. We're talking about practice. Not a game. Not, a, not, not the game that I go out there and, and die for and play every game like it's my last. Not the game. We're talking about practice, man. I mean, how silly is that? I mean, we're talking about practice. I know I'm supposed to be there. I know I'm supposed to lead by example. I know that. And I'm not, I'm not shoving it aside, you know, like it don't mean anything. I know it's important. I do. I honestly do. But we're talking about practice, man. What are we talking about? Practice? We're talking about practice, man. We're, talk we're talking about practice. We're talking about practice. We ain't talking about the game. We're talking about practice, man. When you come into the arena and you see me play, you see me play, don't you? You see me give everything I got, right? Absolutely. But we talking about practice right now. But it's an issue that you're coaching. We talking about practice. Man, I look, I hear you. I, it's funny to me, too. I, I mean, it's strange, it's strange to me, too. But we talking about practice, man. We're not even talking about the game, the actual game, when it matters. We talking about practice. Now, is it possible, though, that from where he's coming from, if you practice, not you would be better, So I'm going to talk about practice. <laughs> 16 years ago, National Basketball Association Hall of Famer and Philadelphia 76ers point guard Allen Iverson delivered what has become one of the most meme-worthy press conference rants of all time. According to a 2016 ESPN article, Iverson said the word practice 22 times during that press conference. And for me, each one, said with a slightly different intonation, gave its delivery an increasingly layered complex meaning richness. Practice as perhaps an insult, practice as an intrinsic um, need to create your craft, or in his case, evidence by how he played. Practice as a ritual. He begins when he speaks to develop a cadence and a rhythm as he goes on to win the reporters over as he repeats the word as a mantra until we aren't even sure what in fact it does mean. Practice as his performance in that instance. I want to talk about three ways Iverson's variations on the word practice can frame an understanding of my process driven approach to art making. So practice as preparation, practice as ritual and repetitive gesture or operation, and practice as the end itself and not the means. If I had the chance to sit with Alan, he might argue that he doesn't really believe in the end. I think uh, a lot of the way that he was initially thinking about it um, and his indignation had to do with the idea of preparation and a belief that the game itself was evidence and proof of his practice. But I think that there was a way in which 
um, his ability to sort of code switch and start to use a singular word to mean many things at the same time to many audiences, not just that uh, set of reporters, but also um, people that maybe interact with him or intersect with him in different ways in his life, can understand that practice, even for him, has some resonance in these three ways that I've sort of thought about it and breaking it down. The multitude of ways in which my work happening more often than not at the same time has been allowed to spill into one another and serve as placeholders, indirect and direct iterations of one another, nonlinear and not beholden to chronology, um, has really gotten me to thinking about practice. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be able to think about a singular question or sometimes multiple questions through multiple lenses at the same time. It eliminates time to be afraid it necessitates making space for changing your mind, for repeating an idea, for failing. It has been an uncomfortable way for me to work. Those of you in the room that have known me since 1979 know that I like to plan every single thing out, and then I like to double plan it and triple plan it. So the idea of working off the cuff or operating at your peak performance because you've practiced um, is something that I believe in in theory, but was quite jarred when I had to start performing and practicing in real life. To call 20 years of work and contemplation to be ready for an opportunity that takes um, high visibility risks and pushes boundaries, it's yielded unimaginable, unimaginable results and growth. My art making approach is extremely process oriented in that I'm drawn to projects that complicate or reveal the connection between the same four topics usually, color, race, space, and value. The prompt I return to over and over again is this one. It's become my security blanket in these last few years. It asks the impossible, but it is also somehow seemingly attainable. It holds space for dissimilar voices at the same time, while also advocating for similar approaches to space making. It's a question, not an answer. It's my compass. On the left is an excerpt of a quote from Daniel Burnham that's talking about the, the attitude or the energy that one has to possess um, in order to think beyond and go beyond what's been imagined or what's been seen and to help others reach that point. It's from his infamous uh, Make No Plans, his, his uh, Burnham plan but also has become sort of a mantra for me as I imagine ways to transform how we can exist and thrive in Chicago. On the right is one of my favorite hip hop artists, another Chicagoan, Common, who in his song, The Corner, basically implored us to do the same thing, but used language and illustration of neighborhoods and streets that I was quite familiar with. So these two worlds, in my mind, can collide. Um, and they also repeatedly help me understand ways in which um, not only code switching, but language, um, color, composition, all are continual factors in the work that I make. And so I use this as a way to enter into projects that I'm working on. I'm going to talk for the first time about a project that I collaborated with with Andres Hernandez and Shawnee Crow, which Anne made some mention of. Um, the project is still up, so in reference to the beginning um, opening about practice, it's also quite unusual, but we've all come to accept it. Um, the idea that, that makers should be able to be articulate and speak about what they've made as soon as they've made it or even before they've made it. Um, it's a reality of the professions that we have chosen, but um, it's often quite daunting and doesn't allow for you to change your mind or make mistakes or have no idea what you're talking about. So um, it's also like a new baby. The project is still up as we speak, um, but I'm quite excited about it. So I've included way too many slides for the project, but since a lot of you were not able to travel to Venice, it's also a nice glimpse into the work um, before it returns home. Last fall, Andres Hernandez and I were selected to be part of the ensemble of seven teams, ranging from artists, architects, designers, and scholars to represent the United States at the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale. The commissioners, SAIC and U Chicago, and their cultural trio, Anne Louie, Mimi Zeiger, and Neil Atkinson, developed a powerful brief and challenged each team to contemplate notions of citizenship at increasingly 
larger scales, inspired in part by the similar work of Powers of Ten authors Ray and Charles Eames. Andres and I were specifically asked to address the idea of the citizen at the scale of the individual. And this was the prompt we were given. At the times, our brains were heavily entranced in the last moments of our Pixel Commission in St. Louis and our ongoing work for the Obama Center. We were on a Southwest flight flying back from St. Louis when we got the news that we'd been selected as part of the team. The emoji surprise look on my face was only rivaled by the, I don't even know what you'd call it, the one eyebrow professor look that Andres often has when he's perplexed about exciting things. What on earth were we going to do? What should the relationship of black Americans be to the term citizen? What should the, rela what should the relationship of black people trained as architects be to a profession that had historically held little space for their particular lens on form making or shaping the built environment? What are we going to talk about? We challenge the assumptions that all people are able to actualize their rights as citizens and enjoy the benefits and responsibilities of citizenship within the built environment. We spent a lot of time making a lot of diagrams that would make our professors at Cornell proud and a lot of stalling by writing notes and post-it notes, um, a lot of writing, a lot of thinking, a lot of panicking, a lot of asking everybody else. In the end, our answer was thrival geographies. In my mind, I see a line, an intervention in the courtyard that has roots in the historical spatial practices of African Americans, yet speculates upon new spatial strategies for advancement beyond mere survival towards a word that we completely made up, thrival, and full participation in the democratic ideal. Superimposing an alternative or rival geography, a phrase expanded upon by Stephanie Camp in her book, Closer to Freedom, of moving across the site our intervention stands on its own terms, an unavoidable part of one's interaction with the forecourt of an architecture that embodies concepts of democratic ideals, but perpetuates falsehoods in order to uphold and maintain those ideals. African Americans are historically and routinely rendered visually transparent, peripheral, part of the landscape, ready to be discarded for spatial convenience. Our use of public space for personal enjoyment has been historically perceived as transgressive behavior and often met with punitive legal action, violence, and at times, death. Given this context, the ability of African Americans to successfully navigate and shape the physical space within their lives has mounted to a de facto survival strategy. Andres and I attended and graduated from architecture school at Cornell University, and according to my husband's watch, we spent exactly 20 years preparing for the moment that was before us. Our smartest move was inviting Shawnee Crow to be our collaborator. A fellow Chicago artist, she brought an expertise and an eye to our early musings that really propelled the work into the stratosphere. Best known for her braided works, she also is an accomplished filmmaker and performance artist. So I'm going to show a little bit of our, our process images to give you an idea of, of what our practice looked like in those months uh, between finding out that we'd been selected and traveling to Venice to mount the work. So this is an image of one of Shani's um, braided works and also her photography. And this is an image of a sketch that Andres had done when we were trying to conceive of a component of the project that we um, have now come to call the pod. Here's an image of Shawnee when we were at Active Alloy um, testing out the pod before it was going to travel to Venice. And I'll just go back and show a little bit of it in its final stage. But I think it's important to note that, that these sketches weren't made at the same time. And so there was a way in which there was a, a real synergy to be working with somebody that was essentially a complete stranger. We cold called her. And to have her come in and understand um, some of the spatial complexities of what it was we were talking about, but then offer so much more, um, not only of her own aesthetic and her skill, but also her understanding um, and spatial acuity to the process. And so she's best known for creating the headpiece for Solange for Saturday Night Live, but in her own right has produced um, amazing works, most recently uh, for 29 Rooms, a beautiful piece called Rest in Peace, Rest in Power. And so it was really invigorating and exciting and something that usually doesn't work very well to collaborate across disciplines in real time 
on a very tight deadline, but it worked out and really was, um, it felt like a site of magic. And so what we often had to do is translate for one another back and forth between our disciplines. Shani is not familiar in a formal sense with architecture, but she really has a strong understanding of a lot of its plastics and components. And um, despite having two small daughters, I am not at all familiar with braiding. And um, Andres and I in real time were quizzing and understanding and learning about different techniques and constantly sort of trying to catalog and understand what those were. And then also think back to um, imagery that maybe we had referenced when we were in school or when we were thinking about African aesthetics and architecture and um, design and have Shani really deconstruct a lot of these components for us down into their systems and parts. She's the fastest braider on earth. If you haven't seen her, you will. Um, and so it was also really exciting to try to understand what we had gotten ourselves into by deciding that we were going to braid this sculpture in Venice just before the opening. We thought that was a good idea. Uh, so we prepared for weeks and months with thousands and thousands of feet of paracord, which is a braided uh, military grade rope. It's extremely strong um, to mimic the strength of hair, which is one of actually the strongest fibers. And so we tested out and um, landed upon a variety of braiding techniques and then decided how we were going to intertwine them to tell the story of thrival geographies. We had an amazing team, our motley crew of volunteers, Corinne Newville, who's a second year graduate student here in architecture, Taylor Chan, who is a former student of mine at IIT in architecture, Nina Kakovic, who's also a former IIT student, um, as well as family, friends, anyone we could grab off the street to help us braid, Megan Bora, Bianca, Memphis, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and then we worked, despite having um, modern technology, Andres and I spent a lot of time making models and sketching by hand and drawing until we really felt like we had a strong understanding and sense of what the project was. And then the team traveled to Venice. We had to ship the framed component of the work before we actually um, were finished with the braiding. And so then a lot of braiding had to happen on site and a lot of real time sort of understanding. And so the, the practice became the project itself in a way that probably made it much more dynamic than how we'd originally imagined it. And it's one of my favorite images of really trying to understand the body in relationship to architecture in real time and the kind of strength um, of the paracord itself. And also to think about going from the reality of a space that's void and what you can imagine to what it really turns into. At Andres's insistence, we folded an earlier 2015 project that had been that I created that had been overshadowed by the debut of Colored Theory at the inaugural Ca uh, Chicago Architecture Biennial. I protested, but luckily Andres prevailed. The project was called Harriet's Refuge, a safe space, a safe passage for free movement in public space. In hindsight, it seems that it's obvious that it had to be part of the project, but again, if you can imagine what was happening in real time, there was no time to even think on this project before four others came in between it and the Biennale itself. Um, so it was also exciting to be able to use a current project to reimagine or to rethink through some components of something um, that had been created not that long ago. And so a key component of that project was a small sign that sat in the window of Columbia College's um, exhibition space um, that said Black Woman Space Matters and had been um, plastered on repeat. So this was not long after the mantra Black Lives Matter had uh, come to fruition and a few of us had started to think about what it would mean to say Black Space Matters. Um, the project itself was a collaboration with Tatiana Falslazade, who's well known for her Stop Telling Women to Smile um, works, among others. And so to add the word woman or to think about what it meant for the two of our practices to come together in the ways in which we'd sort of been um, moving through public space and making commentary about what a woman's place relates, related to art and public art should be um, was quite powerful but was something that was actually pretty mundane and overlooked in the way in which it was received by uh, passers-by on Wabash. 
So central to that was um, Harriet Tubman. And of those of you, I'm sure many of you in the audience were able to um, witness in person this amazing image. Um, so I thought I'd just put this in here from the recent Charles White show that just closed. But to understand the kind of power and, um, and bravery and practice of this woman, I think um, this drawing is one of the ones that really helps me understand in a way that never really resonated when the stories were told during Black History Month or you sort of got a glimpse in some um, short paragraph about who Harriet Tubman was. So Harriet's Refuge, a safe passage for free movement in public space focused upon black women's right to safely occupy public outdoor spaces. It was part of a larger project that Columbia College's Lisa Page Lieberman curated called Vacancy. Tatiana and I created a full-scale transportable architectural structure with the intent of deploying it along Desire Paths in empty lots on the south side. So for those of you that don't know, Desire Paths is a, is a primarily planning terminal I just given to the, the path that's worn through vacant lots or vacant parcels that create um, a shortcut typically um, to a destination instead of walking the kind of um, X and Y of a, of a given parcel. And so for me, it's really powerful to imagine that that sort of line is tread with a kind of collective, um, a collective acceptance or a collective decision to do something and when in fact people are not talking to each other about it. So that path gets worn by the repetition of exactly the same sorts of lines or walks being created. And so what is the power of that as a spatial gesture or a collective spatial gesture? And what does it mean to provide refuge or respite um, for Harriet Tubman, who traveled back and forth along invisible routes 13 times to help others achieve their freedom. What would it look like to translate that into some sort of structure? What if her path were visible? And so the end result was um, an experimentation with tensegrity systems or tensegrity structures, which is a structural system that grows stronger the more pressure is placed on it, it's a tensile system. So to think about that as an individual um, armature or pod that could shroud her, or also something that could aggregate itself and serve as a kind of collective communal space or collective protective space. And a second project which played indirectly into a lot of the thinking that we did in relationship to thrival geography and the creation of a, of a, of a safe space or a space um, for black women to exist within that courtyard in Venice was a project that I did at the Arts Club of Chicago, which Anne also referenced, called Uppity Negress. So I like the, the definition or the description that Natalie Moore, um, author of The South Side and WB Easy Reporter and friend of mine gives she says, historically, whites have used the word uppity or phrase uppity in to describe blacks who didn't stay in their place. Those black women and men who didn't capitulate to white authority sometimes faced violence. And so to imagine what it might mean to insert yourself into a discourse or a discipline or a space in which historically there was no intention for you to be in, there becomes a schism when you occupy that space as if you have the right to it. I was fascinated by the way the garden operates at the arts club as a liminal space between private and public. I wanted to use that spatial condition as a metaphor to conditions black women often face in the public world. What happens when we get a little too uppity? Mike Slattery constructed a second metal fence that initially mimics in scale and placement the existing fence. So let's see what's a good picture to show it. It breaks away and meanders to confuse the zones of the courtyard boundary, blurring the distinction between occupiable spaces. The installation highlighted concepts of authority and access and noted when each is being granted or denied. Recent instances in contemporary culture have resurrected the term uppity to challenge the suggestion that black women have forgotten their place or often need reminding. By venturing out of line, the fence creates a disorienting space that calls into question the relationship between restraint and protection. 
The pickets of the fence deform and march, forward, march toward a banner cascading from the second floor window with an excerpt from Sandra Bland's arrest transcript in which excerpts from First Lady Michelle Obama's speech to Tuskegee University graduates replaces the, offers, the officer's dialogue that escalates the situation that ultimately ended in Bland's death. My exploration of what it might have meant to hold liminal space for support and security and alternate paths for Sandra, the countless others whose names we don't know, the First Lady, as well as many more. In this case, I traded the neoclassical courtyard of Venice for a modernist one. As part of the opening reception, um, Karis Adams, who's an artist in Chicago as well, um, read the, the entire banner um, and attempted to do it without any emotion, which was a, quite a difficult task. And then I had Natalie read a passage from her Southside book in which she talks about um, owning and claiming the title uppity. And she read over the um, recording of Karis speaking. So not so successful component of the project was that these, these kind of deforming pickets of the fence were actually mimicking um, an excerpt or a cutout or a collage of um, the final photographic shoot that Annie Leibovitz did of Michelle Obama at the White House just before their departure and really trying to think about um, what, what those arms were holding down or holding up and the idea of being held up or down and using that, again, as a sort of uh, correlation between the body and architecture. And thinking about these arms this weekend and how the idea that you speak out for yourself um, in some ways lands you maybe not where you want to be, but ultimately also allows you to demonstrate who you really are. And so the project that really got me up on this stage so for those of you that have seen it a million times or participated or have driven past or have had to hear me whine about it, you'll have to hear it one more time. And for those of you that have never seen it, I hope that I can do it justice um, in, in all the meanings that uh, it has provided me. So color theory, while not intentionally, initially conceived of in light of the works that I had shown previously, um, achieved almost the same, this correlation between the body and architecture in eight fell swoops. Eight houses slated for demolition were painted with a culturally coded color palette over the course of a year and a half, mostly in Inglewood neighborhood, in the Inglewood neighborhood, um, and were selected when they stood in isolation and represented architecture that had been disregarded by just about everyone. I would scour the city's demolition permit list I would do drive-bys in the neighborhood to see houses that weren't being loitered on or occupied illegally, um, build up of fines for grasses being too high or in the winter, no, no steps in the snow um, to indicate occupation. The houses represent architecture at its last moments, the ones that we don't think of when we draw on fresh sheets of paper. The intentional disinvestment and racist urban planning and land use policies that are the systemic residue are these houses. The selected hues of paint gestures acted as highlighters and because of their monolithic nature punctuated those objects in the fields. There are a limited number of colors in the visible spectrum and architectural form doesn't magically make it superior to anything else. It's stewardship that's necessary to frame what it's ultimately going to be. For me, it was really a project that was about becoming a better painter. These are works that I'd made prior to coming back to Chicago between the, the years of quitting my job at the architecture firm in San Francisco and becoming a full-time painter and then ultimately moving back to Chicago. And so while the paintings were important in that moment and exciting to me, I was also concerned with how to push them further, what to introduce into my practice to make them evolve. 
and how to evolve with a changing life and changing realities. These are my assistants. How to make paintings <laughs> in light of all of these new developments and how to fold in all of those developments into the practice that I wanted to have as an artist. And so at some point, I realized that there was no law that meant that I had to be an artist or an architect, that nobody was going to arrest me if I decided I wanted to do both and could choose the way that I wanted to do it because I no longer had a job. Um, I thought really strongly about the way in which architecture had been presented to me and the frame in which it had been explained um, inherently made us feel that certain things were worthy and certain things were not. And so on the right, you see a picture of a dilapidated uh, Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier. And on the left, you see a picture of a dilapidated Harold's Chicken, soon to be Harold's Chicken Shack house in Inglewood, just off of um, State and about 60th. That's probably still Washington Park even. Um, and so then it, it kind of dawned on me that there's, there's a way in which the narrative can be shifted if we think differently about how we're applying the information that we've been giving or the context in which we expect it um, to be applied. And so what happens if we embrace or accept a way in which we're supposed to understand relationships of architecture and value, but we shift them to landscapes that we've been told are valueless inherently just because of their existence or who occupies them? And so what does it mean at the same time to think through a lineage of people who've spent their whole life in practice of understanding a, a medium or a craft or a technique? In this case, Albers and his homage to the square, which was a work of practice in and of itself in addition to the works that he produced. And my other buddy, Le Corbusier, and his polychromy. Um, and his passion for both painting and architecture as well. And so to really think about what it would mean for me to be in dialogue with these two gentlemen and to think about what I could add to the conversation uniquely. And so thinking about my own understanding of color and expertise led to a transition from color theory to colored theory. And so I thought about products that would conjure the color before the object or the product. These are a few that got me started. And ultimately, I ended up with a palette of eight. There are some here that, that never manifest themselves as uh, paintings. And then were applied over the course of that year and a half in order to really not only understand what it meant to bring these two passions of mine together, painting and architecture, but also to understand color at a large scale in a way that I couldn't control. Um, the initial prompt, which was given to me by Tricia Van Eck when I was a uh, participant in the uh, center program at the High Park Art Center, was paint at the scale of architecture. And at the time, it sounded so mundane. And then when she pressed me the next day to actually go and do it, I told her I was pregnant, so I, uh, sorry I couldn't do it. And then she eliminated that barrier. And then I didn't have all my colors finished, and she eliminated that barrier. And so on and on we went with the, the doing and the firing before the aiming to see what the result might be. And so since these houses were supposed to come down relatively quickly, there was limited risk in my mind of getting arrested or fined or in trouble for doing this uh, unsanctioned work. But as those of you know, any of you who work for the city, the, this because it's been listed doesn't mean it's gonna happen. And so what these also became was my obsession when the seasons continued and time kept going and the demolitions never came. This is a recent image by David Shalil, I think um, earlier this summer. Um, and so then, again, there's a moment in which you contemplate what the efficacy of the project is, who the audience is, um, what the result is, what your action should be, when does a project end. It elicits more questions than it does answers. I want to give a shout out to my original paint crew. We started with 
a few people. Most of the time, that's my husband on the left, and there's me pretending in the middle on the right to climb the ladder. Um, he's coaching me. We started with a small crew. There's Foe and Norman and Eileen, Andres, see you. Um, but then very quickly, it became another project. When people started to find out about it and decided that it was social practice or that it was something that um, could make them feel better about their helplessness or feelings of helplessness about a community, then it became a community project. Um, luckily, it became that nearing the final of the eight originally selected structures. And it helped me understand that the word community needs a vacation. So on our final painting, which we coincided with the opening of the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, we had over 70 people and a drone and donuts and a sign-in table. Uh, it was a little overwhelming. We had the entire art practice class from Kenwood High School. They brought flaming Red Hot Cheetos because they thought that it was a Cheetos party. They were extremely disgusted with me that it was not, and they also took issue um, with the house not being speckled. <laughs> so we got into a very large argument about if the color should be the bag, a merger of the bag, or the Cheetos themselves. So this is color theory and colored theory at its best. <laughs> There's our matching t-shirts. I don't think you can see the drone in this picture. This is a drone, my spirit of space. But for this final iteration, it was really important to me that a component of the project that had been easily overlooked um, in these feel-good moments is that these are structures that have been abandoned and left for dead and are going to go away and aren't necessarily going to be replaced with anything that then um, brings a new possibility to these neighborhoods or to these spaces. And so what does it mean to call yourself an architect in those moments? And what is the trauma if you live and exist in environments in which houses coming down are as common as going to school? And so as the houses began to come down, another component that I probably knew somewhere in my head but hadn't really been paying attention to was the, was the, um, the abundance of Chicago common brick that sits either at the base of these houses or serves as some component of their um, structural system. And so again, it reminded me of um, a lot of the, the things that we'd read or thought about in architecture school in relationship to the iconic greats, um, the Altos and the Frank Floyd Wrights um, and the Louis Kahn's. But how do we translate or transform those components to these same environments and give them that same um, level of significance and dignity? And so in thinking about this material and thinking about the way in which my predecessors had described with one another, the power of this material and linking it to color, in this case gold, I began exploring ways in which we could think about the, um, the elemental objects of the architecture as gold themselves, both literally and in an, in an economic sense, if they populate much of the ground um, in an invisible capacity often of these demolished sites. So once again, Tricia, pressured me to really put my money where my mouth was and ask me if I'd ever actually built anything with bricks, which I had not with my own hands. I'd just drawn really great details. Um, along with three arts, uh, we mounted a project called Brick by Brick as part of Trisha's VIP series with several other uh, three arts awardees. And so on the course of four days in Expo in 2016, we built a wall and then tore a wall down. This is also in September of 2016, just before the November 2016 election, so the talk of walls was prolific. And so we really wanted to um, have people understand how difficult it is to actually build a wall, but to also understand that the character of the wall um, potentially has a rich opportunity when done in a communal capacity to offer a lot more than it would have with the array or repeat copy and repeat function on a CAD program that sort of lays out the way structures are typically built. These are again are my assistants helping me here. You can see uh, we had Union Bricklayers set the wall for us. We had Michelle Nordermeyer and my former assistant Amanda Wills as well as a bricklayer from one of the local unions 
set it up for us so you can see that it's meticulous and beautiful at the bottom. Then we have the vernissage layer, which is a little bit inebriated. And then we have the weekend where people are just bringing their kids, hoping that there's something to do. So there's sometimes not mortar or sometimes only mortar. Um, but the character of the wall is actually quite beautiful um, and lends itself to an understanding of the hand and the body in relationship to an architecture, to architecture in a way that I probably would not have um, understood otherwise. And so again, in real time, trying to imagine a multitude of ways to really think through the idea of color, form, space, race, and value. Um, I was simultaneously gold leafing the bricks that had come from these demolitions that I mentioned. So this is an example of how the bricks are stacked. Um, the stackers usually get between 10 and $15 per stack. A stack is a ton in terms of weight. It's about 540 bricks. And then these, these pallets are sold for anywhere between $250 and $500 a pallet. So on the one hand, it's not huge amounts of money, but on the other hand, the differential between the laborers and the benefactors of those is huge. And if you could find a way to operationalize that, we literally would be sitting on a gold mine. So my friend um, Anton Seals came up with the title in a riff that we had back and forth about um, understanding the potential value of these parcels. He said, it's a gold mine, but is the gold mine? So that set off um, really interesting speculation and then um, manifest itself and two simultaneous projects as well. My installation at the Museum of Contemporary Art in which had an overload of gold, one of which was, was um, again, bricklayers coming in to brick in one of the entrances to one of the galleries, and then we leafed it with gold brick. And then taking a detail of that image and using it for Monique Meloche's off-the-wall public art project that she does yearly on bus bitch ads in um, Bucktown and Wicker Park, and making a correlation again about who gets the right to, to benefit from um, contemporary art or discourse around conversations of art and also the environment. So this was unrolled um, from September to December of that year, um, and they were all around, and it was different zooms or details of, of explorations in gold. And this year is part of Expo's override program Andres Hernandez and I um, will be participants using an image that was from our Pixel Commission in St. Louis called Away Away Listen While I Say. And so this image shot by Michael Thomas will be on billboards, digital, um, all across uh, the downtown area. And so that overload of gold and that overload of opportunities to have discourse about color, race, space, and value also spilled into um, the ways in which I thought about the installation I did at the Museum of Contemporary Art, the exhibition, excuse me, Chicago Works, um, and really trying to make sense of what it means to bring that conversation to institutional walls that people who look like me might not typically think they have a right to be in or have an interest in being in. And so what does it mean to have the conversations that we're having in those vacant fields, in these spaces, and vice versa? And what does it mean to have the opportunity to operate on spaces that have been given high value placement with spaces that have been given no value placement? And what are the potentials of the synergy between those spaces for people that occupy both to imagine new worlds for themselves? So one piece in particular I'll pull out is a piece called Dream or Some Substance, A Beam or a Necklace of Freedom, which is a, an excerpt from a rap lyric in which the rappers are contemplating um, why they're rapping. This was a moment in which rap was, was becoming very mainstream and extremely lucrative, and the, the artist prodigy was really um, imploring his fellow artists to really think about why it is that they make their work and why it is that they practice what they do. And so, in a way to think about a program that we have here in Chicago called the Dollar Lot Program or the Large Lots Program, in which um, neighborhoods that have uh, proliferation of vacancy and vacant parcels um, will allow city owners to purchase lots that are in direct proximity to their lot. Um, and so, as you can imagine, a neighborhood like Inglewood has a huge amount of um, parcels available um, 
And so it made me really sort of think about how we could translate that or describe that in architectural terms in the space of the museum. So we created a scaled room that was a typical lot in Chicago is 25 feet by 125 feet. And so to scale that would be six feet by 15 feet and it fit into one of the rooms. But to only allow a slight sliver to view into the room and not access the room except for um, a selected group of collaborators who were all um, from Inglewood and all were friends or acquaintances of mine. And so they were allowed access in this unique way that other museum goers were not to really shift the conversation about who, who's valuable, when, and in what context. And so I'd like to use this project also to think a little bit about that earlier comment about community needing a vacation and to think about communal acts that allow for really interesting um, impacts that might not be immediately felt. So these are three of the residents. There was a lot of um, fun and excitement in making the piece, but there's also a lot of pride in seeing your name on a museum wall and, and being able to claim ownership for something um, in an environment that you never maybe imagined, when typically you're not able to claim ownership of that same symbolic thing in the neighborhoods that you do find yourself in. This is um, Memphis on the far left, who's a, who's a protege of my husband's, and has, I've stolen him, and he's been participating on a lot of my projects lately. Um, there was this great moment where um, we'd finished with the work, and the museum was thanking them and telling everybody, you know, we're so excited that you were here and that you participated in this project. Um, and, you know, please, this is your home, come back anytime. And Memphis whispered to me, I'm never coming back here. <laughs> um, so these ways in which we think community works and engagement works and connecting with people works, and then it doesn't. But he did come back because this is opening night and he wore his colored theory shirt. So he wasn't really, he was fooling us. But I do think it's just important to, to again, when we think about that idea of the immediate or the gratification that we seek, that if we're truly um, invested in our practice, it doesn't come in the forms that we expect. And um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to have the tidy endings that we want it to. Memphis was also disgusted with the people who were not perfect with with the leafing. He's actually quite meticulous, and he wanted, them, he wanted them to all leave so he could do it right. But it, like the brick wall, has a beautiful hand and patina. It looks uniform, but on close inspection, you really can see the differences in the ways in which um, each person began to paint with the gold leaf. And I just want to give a special shout out to one of the other participants, Tanika Johnson, and when we talk about impact and the ways in which there are overlaps in how we work. Uh, Tanika is a, a photographer and an amazing artist in her own right, and we met through Tracy Hall um, at last year's open engagement, and Tanika was extremely nervous, and I didn't understand why, and so she comes over and she says, I took a picture of my daughter's friend in front of your house. And so people have come to refer to the color theory houses as mine, but I actually have my own house, so I was a little bit confused. And then she explained, and then I was the one that was nervous and tearing up um, that the project had resonated and that she, that she felt a connection to it in this way or that her daughter and her friends had felt a connection and wanted to be photographed in front of the house. And so this is the, the, the Loose Squares house, but the picture is just extremely beautiful. And it gave us an interaction and a dialogue as artists that didn't have anything to do with being black or women or from the South Side or disenfranchised or discriminated against. It was about two artists getting to collaborate in a very interesting and unique way. Um, and if you haven't seen it yet, she's got an exhibition that's up through October 20th at the uh, Loyola University Museum of Art called Folded Map, where she's ingeniously connected people with the same addresses on their north and south axis. So 60 whatever South Sangamon is 60 whatever North Sangamon, and she's connected the residents. They've interacted, they've talked. I think they are interacting on their own outside of her now. She photographed, documented, and videoed this component. And she, along with Paolo Aguirre, who's one of the instructors here at, at SAIC, created a beautiful map where you can actually um, map your, your counterpart. So if you haven't seen it, I would employ you to do so. So in closing, I just want to say, um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to continue to have the luxury to think iteratively about my 20-year preoccupation with color as spatial, racial, and conceptual. I'm excited to see what unfolds here at SAIC over the next several months and glad for a chance to interact with my peers. 
a practice of simultaneity and privilege at full scale in real time without the benefit or reflection of space, releasing the pressure of always simply working toward an end or an imposition to decouple or parse my architecturalness from my artness, my blackness from my girlness, my everydayness from my magicness, my Ivy Leagueness from my Southside Auburn Greshamness, to hold space for the practice of it all. So I thank you all for listening and to Allen Iverson for ranting. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, well, thank you. I'm thinking about um, Claudia Rankin's book, and she was one of the last black women to speak in that podium. And mm -hmm. she talked about the story of um, the being in line for um, the, the postal service and a white man going across her and seeing, I don't see, like I didn't see you, oh sorry I didn't see you, and this idea of invisibility that you play with your work, and I wonder if it played a part in conceptualizing the book to the exhibition in Venice, um, the citizen prompt that you were given, or if the way the, that If her she, book or the way that she was describing it? And the way that she uses both like poetics and kind of personal life, um, kind of experience of exclusion, and invisibility in the, the short narratives and how there's so much space in the book. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So my collaborator, Andres Hernandez, um, we had a reading list. We, have a very, we had a very serious stack of books going back even to our um, primers from college from our, our African architecture studies. He had a serious book list for us. Um, and I didn't read very many of them, but I reread the Claudia Renke as one of them. And so, it didn't. It wasn't a. It wasn't a, a kind of conscious connection. But there was a, the beauty and the poetry and the and the way it did hold, um, both kind of a realism, but then also the surrealism. So sometimes you're reading and you're like, did that really happen? Like there was a lot of times you read and you're like, is that is that a real Serena story or that did she make that up? Right. And so there was a way in which I think we wanted to have the works, uh, the the Venice work have a hold that liminality or kind of be very real and about very real experiences, but at the same time kind of transcend that. So I don't think that was one of the ones that we used to directly correlate the form making, but there definitely was a, a, a desire to have an energy. Um, and a, I won't say a fight, but we definitely went back and forth also about um, how poetic should it be? There's a, there's a self-consciousness because we are trained as architects, but we've left that profession to be artists, so there's always a, um, a guilt or an insecurity, right? And then to have been invited to be amidst, you know, the visionaries and the luminaries of our, our field that we've abandoned <laughs> was, was a little daunting. So how to, the legitimacy or like maybe an insecurity about the poetics that I think in the end won out and played itself out well, but there was a there was a conscious decision to think about um, how to use an, an example of space being described in that way, or space space being created by non-space makers. Um, how do you translate that? So that's I'm glad for that question. Hi, this is absolutely amazing. Um, I've found myself at most of your artist talks in Chicago, uh, and every time I found a new thing to accept okay, and appreciate. Good. Good. Uh, yeah, don't worry. I think okay. it's great. If that matters. <laughs> but um, I'm wondering, uh, realizing that you were uh, an architect and seeing how uh, obviously very uh, into hip hop, 
and like how you've integrated hip hop into almost like all of your work, I'm wondering if you had to like battle with your own values on like both building and being a part of what some people would think is the destruction of a building and then watching after you paint it, watching it actually be destroyed. Um, I wonder if you've had to wrestle with those values or if you've always seen it that way or the way you do now. Wrestle with those values relationship to hip hop as a metaphor for it or just two, two separate things? Uh, sorry, specifically in relation to graffiti. Relationship to? Graffiti. Graffiti. Ah. Um, no, I didn't always see it like that. That was definitely something I thought about when I, when I started thinking about color theory. Um, I was scared I was going to get arrested, so I was like, it's vandalism, so we read about the vandalism, but when you paint something in monolithic colors, apparently it's not vandalism, or it's, it's art, or it's beautiful, or I don't know what. So, um, it definitely was like a spirit of, there wasn't a desire to sort of do something to be bad, or be wrong, or tagging in some sense of kind of like claiming in that way, but it was about, um, about wanting to to make sure this thing was seen or like, but not, but not in commentary, I don't know, I can't describe it. Like, it was, it was more about um, wanting to be like, I'm still alive, like I am here, as opposed to I have the right to be here, which I feel like I always conceived of graffiti in that way. It was either about a battle between people that are trying to claim ownership of a thing by tagging over each other, but also like, I, I have the right to be here. And so it was slightly different I'm glad that it morphed and it, or, it, or it can be read in that other way because I definitely am of that era and generation. So it's, it's cool to have another way to think about it. It's also helpful, you know, post-rationalization that I'm a girl and girls are left out so I had to have another way to tag and my way is prettier. And, but none of that was really there in the beginning. But does that answer, is that what you were thinking about or more so this idea of it, when you said the destruction of it going away, the idea of it being temporary and like knowing that it wasn't gonna be there? I don't wanna take up too much time. Okay. <laughs> so yes, the demolition part was important and the temporality part was important, but I didn't think of it in terms of hip hop until you just said that. So that was, that's, thank you for that. That's a powerful additional reading which I think is, is valid or accurate. Hi, thank you so much um, for another great Chicago talk. Um, so my question has more to do with your professorial role here at SAIC. So Joseph yes. Albers, of course, was a lifelong um, instructor and he really found a lot of his practice through, the, um, through instruction. So I'm just kind of wondering, do you have any pedagogical sort of inspiration that, sort of, that you're excited to bring into the SAIC fold, or is there anything in particular that you find instruction bringing to your own practice? Thank you for that question. Um, so I have a, right now I have like a love-hate relationship with teaching. I've been doing way too many things, and so uh, haven't been able to focus in a way that I, that I had enjoyed previously when nobody was paying any attention. So I taught at CCA in California, California College of the Arts. I taught at IIT. Uh, taught with Andres at Wash U, and then I taught recently at Cornell um, in a guest capacity. And so each of those have been very different, and in the, in the more recent iterations, it's very hard to, um, to translate the work you're doing in real time to your students, which is something I had previously enjoyed. Um, and so I'm glad for the structure of this professorship for a few reasons. So one is, I feel like the spirit or the heart of it is really about interdisciplinary work or really trying to test the, test the boundaries of that. And I think that's a strength of SAIC. So uh, it was really important to me to do something that I couldn't do already because I happen to live here and most of the faculty are friends of mine. So I didn't want to just do something we, we could go do on our own, but to really kind of push and test what that might look like. So I'm super excited for that as an opportunity. And then in terms of like a pedagogy, I think what I've realized of late is that this, this idea of practice that I'm trying to mull over here, this idea of like iterative stuff and not being worried about if it works or it doesn't work, translates. That's a little daunting or disconcerting for students, especially architecture students who like very 
clear things and how it has to operate, which I can sympathize with, but really want to push the boundary of and to really get, get everybody to think about a studio as a laboratory and to make mistakes and experiment and to um, really push the boundaries of, of their own convictions. Um, not just, not just the, the source of that, but also like ways in which we can do better. We can make better stuff, not just better craft, but better places. And so how do you do that if you're not, if you're kind of comfortable with the way that you operate? Like so many people are like, oh, I don't, I'm not really a painter. Oh, I don't really do someone. It's like, how do you know? Like who can say that, right? Especially when we have these living legends amongst us who are like constantly morphing before our very eyes. There's no reason to be saying what you really aren't, you know, at a third of their age. So um, for me, that's where my head is at. I don't know what it will manifest itself as in this, it, this capacity, but I think that the, the bones of, of this kind of professorship lend itself to, to that kind of energy. And hopefully the people that, that are attracted to it will come with that kind of mindset. Okay. Hiya, thanks for your talk. Um, I was interested by, with the houses, if you ever got a chance to go inside them, or if, if you did, if there was any life left over, if you researched around the houses themselves. So for, for, for this particular iteration, I actually was um, very adamant about not going in the houses because um, so much of the, so so much of, for, at least for me, the work that I had been doing around um, identity and space was about injustice. And so a lot of the work dealt with like tragedy or there was an energy to the work that's always about like the story and how the story is about being wronged in some capacity because that's generally most of the stories in those contexts. And so for once, I, I wanted to put that on the shelf and just think about the object, the architecture itself and the form. And so I, I purposely never went inside any of the houses. There was an instance where um, uh, I took a, a group um, of individuals from something called the Odyssey Project, um, which Eric Dudley is involved in at, at U Chicago, and then also Mike Norse, um, who's at High Park Art Center in CAD. Uh, we went very early in the morning. They wanted to go when I, at, and tour the houses at the time that I actually had been working on them. And so Mike actually went inside. He tried to convince me to go inside. So I never went, but he took a red painting from the red house. There was one painting left on the wall and I think maybe a shoe. But it, it, for me, it would go too much into wanting to understand the whole story as opposed to wanting to think about the architectural object in that moment at the, at the end of its life. Um, so I never went in, but there was another moment when the, when the Flamin' Hots house was being torn down, there was a happy birthday banner that was hanging from the ceiling, and so the claw goes in to take it down, and the banner's still there. And so, well, I cry a lot, so that's not really a good metric, but I cried in that moment. Like, I've been watching the house come down all morning, I'm, like, documenting it and stop motion with the, f and in that moment, it was like, what were the circumstances that they would have to leave so urgently that the happy ba birthday banner is still up, right? The copper's been stolen and whatever else is gone, so people have come and taken all of that, but the banner's still up. Like, what, what, would, what would necessitate that? And, and what are architects supposed to do with that? Like, w we're just not responsible for that? Or, you know, what is our role in those, when we understand the things that we make have, can take on these narratives? Um, so other than that, I didn't really, really try to, try to to stay away from an idea about how the house got to be at that point. I mean, I feel like I do a lot of other thinking and work around that and advocating against that. So um, the specific story I didn't focus on for the color theory project. Hi, <laughs> my name is Trinidad, and that was lovely. Thank you so much. I was, where is Andres Hernandez? I don't know where he is, but I was his student. <laughs> um, and I think that it was, it's interesting because I feel that even though 
I don't like know you. And being in that class, we were talking a lot about, you know, like your work and the ideas that you were, you know, thinking about together. And so before meeting you, I feel that I already knew a little bit about you and kind of like the intellectual side. And I just want to say that it was, I just feel that I have to say this because I was in that class and in a way I participated, you know, in those ideas. And when we went to the MCA, one of the things that called my attention the most, you know, was like looking at the South Side as a concept. And I'm from Ecuador, I'm from South America, and that idea of looking at it as a concept completely, you know, also changed something in me and helped me um, think about this entire idea uh, as a foreign as well. And so I guess my question is, when you think about community, you know, what do you think? Like, what are the things that you think about when you think of community? You know, besides the like African-American community, besides you as a woman, um, because I was also highly influenced by that as a Southern from South America, who was, you know, you know, South America was mainly colonized for the gold. And so when I look at your work, it's like all that resonates so much. And I'm just curious of knowing about your thoughts and what community is for you. Thanks. So um, I was a little caught off guard, actually, when, when the project started to get a lot of visibility um, and people started talking about community and how, you know, how did you figure out how to engage community? And I was completely confused. It's like, I am from Auburn Gresham. Like, I am the community. So it's very strange to ask me questions about how I engage with myself. Um, but then I recognize, right, that I'm, that I'm also a trained architect or a so-and-so, right? And so over the years, you come to, to not feel the pressure of, like, bifurcating yourself or breaking yourself up or you know, the art and architecture was maybe the last frontier of things I held separate, but at some point it's like, I don't wake up like, today am I a woman first or am I black first? Am I Anthony's sister or Issa's mother, right? I don't, that's not what any of us does, right? And so um, it was much more telling about the way that you write that, that community is like this concept or this, this othering that we still are not really away from when we talk about it in certain contexts. And early on when I would talk about the project and you saw my shout out to the painting crew, it's like there's my community and they're all artists. And some of them live in the neighborhood and some of them don't and some of them are into what I was doing and some of them weren't. They just didn't want to hear me complaining about it anymore so they came and helped. Like that's a community too. And so I think there's a way in that slide that says community needs a vacation. It's very comfortable to call a certain group or a situation that you feel overwhelmed by but maybe are kind of complicit in and don't want to acknowledge it. So it's easy to be like, oh, the community, the community, you know. Um, and so I was telling somebody or maybe in one of the other talks was saying, you know, the community is as varied as the colors. So the people on the, on the currency exchange and safe passage block, they don't, they're not happy with me, right? They're like, you have these hideous yellow things in our neighborhood and we don't like you and you embarrass us and right and then I'm I'm text buddies with the families that live on the Crown Royal block right and so there's a there's a way in which I I get a kind of access because of what I look like that can either then discount the other things that would make me a foreigner in those contexts um, and vice versa, right? And so that's a power that I've always had that I call this code switching, which you saw Alan Iverson doing early on, right? At first he was very defensive and it was about indignation. And then when he realized that there were people there that shared his view, but they had a job to do, then he won them over. There was, you know, so there's a whole way in which when you can leverage that, that, that doubleness or the duality or the two-ness or the three-ness that you can really harness that and actually add to conversations that have been very monolithic up until now. So thank you too for your, your words. You, yes. Hi, thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, this is really great. 
Um, and I'm thinking, I mean, I think it's so great that you um, moved out of architecture, because obviously you're doing things that um, uh, are really fulfilling for us and I hope for you. Um, but I'm curious, if you were to do <laughs> architecture, <laughs> no, I'm just, I would be so interested like seeing your points of view and all that goes into the art that you make, like what would be the principles that would guide you as an architect? I mean, I don't know what you did as an architect, but what would be the principles and what, what do you think architects can do in the directions that you're pointing in your artwork? Does that make sense? Yes, I've been dreading this question. Oh, no. Uh, no, it's a well, good one. Oh, good. Um, I don't know. That's a tough one. Um, this journey I've been on has allowed me to also um, befriend Jeannie Gang, who before now was like a... It's like, ah. So we talk about it a lot, um, but there's a patience, too. That there's, no, there's no rush to figure that out, but I think it's... I feel privileged to be able to have, um, you know, this this like living cohort, this community of people that that are there to support what that could look like, and to also insist that it doesn't look like me returning back to a board and creating in that same way. Um, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it, and I'm glad that I people receive architectural AIA credit for hearing me talk when they can hear me for free. Um, but I don't know, it has to be, it can't, it can't be either or anymore. Like I've, I've messed that up now. I can't, you know, before when it was just like paintings and like redoing my girlfriend's house that she bought from her parents. Like that was very clear, right? It's like, but now it has to be more. Like I've, I've been charged to think about it in a way that has to go beyond that. So I don't know what that looks like. Right now it's these, these larger installations, right? That are increasing in, duration, the, the temporality of them maybe is getting longer, but they're still potentially described as structure, uh, sculpture or installations. I don't know what it looks like. I think for me, it's also returning back to the way in which we're complicit in how the city, Chicago in particular, continues to be so imbalanced. And so it also can't just be, you know, a community center. Or, and again, no shade on community centers, but I, it, can't, it has to push past that. So that's where I'm stuck for a little bit. So hopefully it doesn't take me 20 more years, but um, to, to be able to be honest that I don't know and to have all these people that are genuinely interested in helping me talk through, you know, and hold me to the standard that it can't, you can't just cheat and go, go kind of do it the way you were trained to do it or the way you assumed you'd be doing it at this point. So it's a, it's a great question, but it's one I've, I'm grappling with. <laughs>